Chapter Eight, Part Two of the Water Babies, by Charles Kingsley, read for LibriVox.org by Corrie Samuel. Tom was so puzzled and frightened with all he saw that he was longing to ask the meaning of it, and at last he stumbled over a respectable old stick lying half covered with earth, but a very stout and worthy stick it was, for it belonged to good Roger Asham in old time and had carved on its head King Edward the Sixth with the Bible in his hand. "'You see,' said the stick, "'there were as pretty little children as once you could wish to see, and might have been so still if they had only been left to grow up like human beings, and then handed over to me. But their foolish fathers and mothers, instead of letting them pick flowers, and make dirt pies, and get birds' nests, and dance round the gooseberry bush, as little children should, kept them always at lessons, working, 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 learning weekday lessons all weekdays, and Sunday lessons all Sunday, and weekly examinations every Saturday, and monthly examinations every month, and yearly examinations every year, everything seven times over, as if once was not enough, and enough as good as a feast, till their brains grew big, and their bodies grew small, and they were all changed into turnips with little but water inside, and still their foolish parents actually pick the leaves off them as fast as they grow, lest they should have anything green about them. "'Ah,' said Tom, "'if dear Mrs. Dewey would be done by knew of it, she would send them a lot of tops, and balls, and marbles, and ninepins, and make them all as jolly as sandboys.' "'It would be no use,' said the stick. "'They can't play now if they tried.' Don't you see how their legs have turned to roots and grown into the ground by never taking any exercise, but sapping and moping always in the same place? But here comes the examiner of all examiners, so you had better get away, I warn you, or he will examine you and your dog into the bargain, and set him to examine all the other dogs, and you to examine all the other water babies. There is no escaping out of his hands, for his nose is nine thousand miles long and can go down chimneys, and through keyholes, upstairs, downstairs, in my lady's chamber, examining all little boys, and the little boys' tutors likewise. But when he is thrashed, so Mrs. B. Dunbar as you did has promised me, I shall have the thrashing of him, and if I don't lay it on with a will, it's a pity. Tom went off, but rather slowly and surlily, for he was somewhat minded to face this same examiner of all examiners, who came striding among the poor turnips, binding heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and laying them on little children's shoulders, like the scribes and Pharisees of old, and not touching the same with one of his fingers, for he had plenty of money, and a fine house to live in, and so forth, which was more than the poor little turnips had. But when he got near, he looked so big and burly and dictatorial, and shouted so loud to Tom to come and be examined, that Tom ran for his life, and the dog too. And really it was time, for the poor turnips, in their hurry and fright, crammed themselves so fast to be ready for the examiner, that they burst and popped by dozens all round him, till the place sounded like Aldershot on a field day, and Tom thought he should be blown into the air, dog and all. As he went down to the shore, he passed the poor turnip's new tomb. But Mrs. B. Dunbar's you did had taken away the epitaph about talents and precocity and development, and put up one of her own instead, which Tom thought much more sensible. Instruction saw a long time I bore, and cramming was in vain, till heaven did please my woes to ease with water on the brain. So Tom jumped into the sea, and swam on his way, singing, Farewell, Tom Toddy's all, I thank my stars, that naught I know save those three royal R's. Reading and writing sure, with arithmetic, will help a lad of sense through thin and thick. Whereby you may see that Tom was no poet. But no more was John Bunyan, though he was as wise a man as you will meet in a month of Sundays. And next, he came to Old Wives' Fabledom where the folks were all heathens, and worshipped a howling ape. And there he found a little boy sitting in the middle of the road, and crying bitterly. 
"'What are you crying for?' said Tom. "'Because I am not as frightened as I could wish to be.' "'Not frightened? You are a queer little chap. But if you want to be frightened, here goes.' "'Boo!' "'Ah,' said the little boy, "'that is very kind of you, but I don't feel that it has made any impression.' Tom offered to upset him, punch him, stamp on him, fettle him over the head with a brick, or anything else whatsoever which would give him the slightest comfort. But he only thanked Tom very civilly, in fine long words which he had heard other folk use, and which, therefore, he thought were fit and proper to use himself, and cried on till his papa and mamma came, and sent off for the pow-wow man immediately. And a very good-natured gentleman and lady they were, though they were heathens, and talked quite pleasantly to Tom about his travels, till the pow-wow man arrived, with his thunderbox under his arm. And a well-fed, ill-favoured gentleman he was, as ever served Her Majesty at Portland. Tom was a little frightened at first, for he thought it was Grimes. But he soon saw his mistake, for Grimes always looked a man in the face, and this fellow never did. And when he spoke, it was fire and smoke, and when he sneezed, it was squibs and crackers, and when he cried, which he did whenever it paid him, it was boiling pitch, and some of it was sure to stick. "'Here we are again!' cried he, like the clown in a pantomime. "'So you can't feel frightened, my little dear, eh? I'll do that for you. I'll make an impression on you. Ya! Boo! Wiroo! Hullabaloo!' And he rattled, thumped, brandished his thunderbox, yelled, shouted, raved, roared, stamped, and danced corroboree like any blackfellow, and then he touched a spring in the thunderbox, and out popped turnip ghosts, and magic lanterns, and pasteboard bogies, and spring-heeled jacks, and salaballas, with such a horrid din, clatter, clank, roll, rattle, and roar, that the little boy turned up the whites of his eyes, and fainted right away. And at that, his poor heathen papa and mamma were as much delighted as if they had found a gold mine, and fell down upon their knees before the pow-wow man, and gave him a palanquin with a pole of solid silver and curtains of cloth of gold, and carried him about in it on their own backs. But as soon as they had taken him up, the poles stuck to their shoulders, and they could not set him down any more, but carried him on willy-nilly, as Sinbad carried the old man of the sea which was a pitiable sight to see, for the father was a very brave officer, and wore two swords and a blue button, and the mother was as pretty a lady as had ever pinched feet like a Chinese. But you see, they had chosen to do a foolish thing just once too often, so, by the laws of Mrs. Beat Dunbar as you did, they had to go on doing it, whether they chose or not, till the coming of the Coxigrews. Ah! Don't you wish that someone would go and convert those poor heathens, and teach them not to frighten their little children into fits? Now then, said the pow man to Tom, wouldn't you like to be frightened, my little dear? For I can see plainly that you are a very wicked, naughty, graceless, reprobate boy. You're another, quoth Tom very sturdily. And when the man ran at him, and cried, Boo! Tom ran at him in return, and cried, Boo! likewise, right in his face, and set the little dog upon him, and at his legs the dog went. At which, if you will believe it, the fellow turned tail, thunderbox and all, with a woof, like an old sow on the common, and ran for his life, screaming, Help! Thieves! Murder! Fire! He is going to kill me! I am a ruined man! He will murder me, and break and burn and destroy my precious and invaluable thunderbox, and then you will have no more thunder showers in the land. Help! 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 At which the papa and mamma, and all the people of old wives fabledom, flew at Tom, shouting, Oh, the wicked, impudent, hard-hearted, graceless boy! Beat him! Kick him! Shoot him! Drown him! Hang him! Burn him! And so forth but luckily they had nothing to shoot, hang, or burn him with, for the fairies had hid all the killing tackle out of the way a little while before, so they could only pelt him with stones, 
and some of the stones went clean through him and came out the other side. But he did not mind that a bit, for the holes closed up again as fast as they were made, because he was a water baby. However, he was very glad when he was safe out of the country, for the noise there made him all but deaf. Then he came to a very quiet place, called Leave Heaven Alone, and there the sun was drawing water out of the sea to make steam threads, and the wind was twisting them up to make cloud patterns, till they had worked between them the loveliest wedding veil of Chantilly lace, and hung it up in their own crystal palace for any one to buy who could afford it while the good old sea never grudged, for she knew they would pay her back honestly. So the sun span, and the wind wove, and all went well with the great steam-loom, as is likely, considering, and considering, and considering, and at last, after innumerable adventures, each more wonderful than the last, he saw before him a huge building, much bigger, and, what is most surprising, a little uglier, than a certain new lunatic asylum, but not built quite of the same materials. None of it, at least, or indeed for out that I ever saw, any part of any other building whatsoever, is cased with nine-inch brick inside and out, and filled up with rubble between the walls, in order that any gentleman who has been confined during Her Majesty's pleasure may be unconfined during his own pleasure, and take a walk in the neighbouring park to improve his spirits, after an hour's light and wholesome labour with his dinner-fork, or one of the legs of his iron bedstead. No, the walls of this building were built on an entirely different principle, which need not be described as it has not yet been discovered. Tom walked towards this great building, wondering what it was, and having a strange fancy that he might find Mr. Grimes inside it, till he saw running towards him and shouting, Stop! three or four people who, when they came nearer, were nothing else than policemen's truncheons, running along without legs or arms. Tom was not astonished. He was long past that. Besides, he had seen the naviculi in the water move nobody knows how a hundred times, without arms or legs or anything to stand in their stead. Neither was he frightened, for he had been doing no harm. So he stopped and when the foremost truncheon came up and asked his business, he showed Mother Carey's pass, and the truncheon looked at it in the oddest fashion, for he had one eye in the middle of his upper end, so that when he looked at anything, being quite stiff, he had to slope himself, and poke himself, till it was a wonder why he did not tumble over. But being quite full of the spirit of justice, as all policemen and their truncheons ought to be, he was always in a position of stable equilibrium, whichever way he put himself. "'All right, pass on,' said he at last, and then he added, "'I had better go with you, young man.' And Tom had no objection, for such company was both respectable and safe. So the truncheon coiled its thong neatly round its handle, to prevent tripping itself up, for the thong had got loose in running, and marched on by Tom's side. "'Why have you no policeman to carry you?' asked Tom, after a while. "'Because we are not like those clumsy made truncheons in the land world, which cannot go without having a whole man to carry them about. We do our own work for ourselves, and do it very well, though I say it who should not.' "'Then why have you a thong to your handle?' asked Tom. "'To hang ourselves up by, of course, when we are off duty.' Tom had got his answer, and had no more to say till they came up to the great iron door of the prison, and there the truncheon knocked twice, with its own head. A wicket in the door opened, and out looked a tremendous old brass blunderbuss charged up to the muzzle with slugs, who was the porter, and Tom started back a little at the sight of him. "'What case is this?' he asked in a deep voice, out of his broad bell-mouth. "'If you please, sir, it is no case, only a young gentleman from her ladyship, who wants to see Grimes, the master sweep.' "'Grimes?' said the blunderbuss, and he pulled in his muzzle, perhaps to look over his prison lists. "'Grimes is up chimney number three four five. 
he said from inside, so the young gentleman had better go on to the roof. Tom looked up at the enormous wall, which seemed at least ninety miles high, and wondered how he should ever get up. But when he hinted that to the truncheon, it settled the matter in a moment, for it whisked round and gave him such a shove behind, as sent him up to the roof in no time, with his little dog under his arm. And there he walked along the leads, till he met another truncheon, and told him his errand. "'Very good,' it said. "'Come along, but it will be of no use. He is the most unremorseful, hard-hearted, foul-mouthed fellow I have in charge, and thinks about nothing but beer and pipes, which are not allowed here, of course.' So they walked along over the leads, and very sooty they were. And Tom thought the chimneys must want sweeping very much. But he was surprised to see that the soot did not stick to his feet, or dirty them in the least. Neither did the live coals, which were lying about in plenty, burn him. For being a water-baby, his radical humours were of a moist and cold nature, as you may read at large in Lemnius, Cardan, Van Helmont, and other gentlemen, who knew as much as they could, and no man can know more. And at last they came to chimney number 345. Out of the top of it, his head and shoulders just showing, stuck poor Mr. Grimes, so sooty and bleared and ugly that Tom could hardly bear to look at him. And in his mouth was a pipe, but it was not a light, though he was pulling at it with all his might. "'Attention, Mr. Grimes,' said the truncheon, "'here is a gentleman come to see you.' But Mr. Grimes only said bad words, and kept grumbling. "'My pipe won't draw, my pipe won't draw.' "'Keep a civil tongue and attend,' said the truncheon, and popped up just like punch, hitting Grimes such a crack over the head with itself, that his brains rattled inside like a dried walnut in its shell. He tried to get his hands out and rub the place, but he could not, for they were stuck fast in the chimney. Now he was forced to attend. "'Hey,' he said, "'why, it's Tom. I suppose you have come here to laugh at me, you spiteful little atomy.' Tom assured him he had not, but only wanted to help him. "'I don't want anything except beer, and that I can't get, and a light to this bothering pipe, and that I can't get either.' "'I'll get you one,' said Tom, and he took up a live coal, there were plenty lying about, and put it to Grimes's pipe, but it went out instantly. "'It's no use,' said the truncheon, leaning itself up against the chimney and looking on. "'I tell you, it is no use. His heart is so cold that it freezes everything that comes near him. You will see that presently, plain enough.' "'Oh, of course it's my fault. Everything's always my fault,' said Grimes. "'Now don't go to hit me again.' for the truncheon started upright and looked very wicked. "'You know, if my arms were only free, you daren't hit me then.' The truncheon leant back against the chimney, and took no notice of the personal insult, like a well-trained policeman as it was, though he was ready enough to avenge any transgression against morality or order. "'But can't I help you in any other way? Can't I help you to get out of this chimney?' said Tom. "'No,' interposed the truncheon. "'He has come to the place where everybody must help themselves, "'and he will find it out, I hope, before he has done with me.' "'Oh, yes,' said Grimes. "'Of course it's me. "'Did I ask to be brought here into the prison? "'Did I ask to be set to sweep your foul chimneys? "'Did I ask to have lighted straw put under me to make me go up? Did I ask to stick fast in the very first chimney of all, because it was so shamefully clogged up with soot? Did I ask to stay here, I don't know how long, a hundred years I do believe, and never get my pipe, nor my beer, nor nothing fit for a beast, let alone a man? No, answered a solemn voice behind. No more did Tom, when you behaved to him in the very same way. It was Mrs. Be done by as you did and when the truncheon saw her, it started bolt upright, attention, and made such a low bow, that if it had not been full of the spirit of justice, it must have tumbled on its end, and probably hurt its one eye. And Tom made his bow too. 
"'Oh, ma'am,' he said, "'don't think about me. That's all past and gone, and good times and bad times and all times pass over. But may not I help poor Mr. Grimes? Mayn't I try and get some of these bricks away, that he may move his arms?' "'You may try, of course,' she said. So Tom pulled and tugged at the bricks, but he could not move one. And then he tried to wipe Mr. Grimes's face, but the soot would not come off. "'Oh, dear,' he said, "'I have come all this way, through all these terrible places, to help you, and now I am of no use at all.' "'You had best leave me alone,' said Grimes. You are a good-natured, forgiving little chap, and that's truth, but you'd best be off. The hail's coming on soon, and it will beat the eyes out of your little head. What hail? Why, hail that falls every evening here, and, till it comes close to me, it's like so much warm rain, but then it turns to hail over my head, and knocks me about like small shot. That hail will never come any more, said the strange lady. I have told you before what it was. It was your mother's tears, those which she shed when she prayed for you by her bedside, but your cold heart froze it into hail. But she is gone to heaven now, and will weep no more for her graceless son." Then Grimes was silent a while, and then he looked very sad. So my old mother's gone, and I never there to speak to her. Ah. A good woman she was, and might have been a happy one in her little school there in Vendale, if it hadn't been for me and my bad ways." "'Did she keep the school in Vendale?' asked Tom. And then he told Grimes all the story of his going to her house, and how she could not abide the sight of a chimney-sweep, and then how kind she was, and how he turned into a water-baby. "'Ah!' said Grimes. Good reason she had to hate the sight of a chimney-sweep. I ran away from her, and took up with the sweeps, and never let her know where I was, nor sent her a penny to help her. And now it's too late, too late," said Mr. Grimes, and he began crying and blubbering like a great baby, till his pipe dropped out of his mouth and broke all to bits. Oh, dear, if I was but a little chap in Vendale again, to see the clear beck and the apple orchard and the yew hedge, how different I would go on. But it's too late now. So you go along, you kind little chap, and don't stand to look at a man crying, that's old enough to be your father, and never feared the face of man, nor of worse, neither. But I'm beat now, and beat I must be. I've made my bed, and I must lie on it. Foul I would be, and foul I am, as an Irishwoman said to me once, and little I heeded it. It's all my own fault, but it's too late." And he cried so bitterly that Tom began crying too. "'Never too late,' said the fairy, in such a strange, soft, new voice, that Tom looked up at her, and she was so beautiful for the moment that Tom half fancied she was her sister. No more was it too late, for as poor Grimes cried and blubbered on, his own tears did what his mother's could not do, and Tom's could not do, and nobody's on earth could do for him. For they washed the soot off his face and off his clothes, and then they washed the mortar away from between the bricks, and the chimney crumbled down, and Grimes began to get out of it. Up jumped the truncheon, and was going to hit him on the crown a tremendous thump, and drive him down again, like a cork into a bottle. But the strange lady put it aside. "'Will you obey me if I give you a chance?' "'As you please, ma'am. You're stronger than me, that I know too well, and wiser than me, I know too well also. And, as for being my own master, I've fared ill enough with that as yet. So whatever your ladyship pleases to order me, for I'm beat, and that's the truth.' Be it so, then, you may come out. But remember, disobey me again, and into a worse place still you go." "'I beg pardon, ma'am, but I never disobeyed you, that I know of. I never had the honour of setting eyes upon you till I came to these ugly quarters." "'Never saw me? Who said to you, those that will be foul, foul they will be?' Grimes looked up, and Tom looked up too 
for the voice was that of the Irishwoman, who met them the day they went out together to Hearthover. I gave you your warning then, but you gave it to yourself a thousand times before, and since. Every bad word that you said, every cruel and mean thing that you did, every time that you got tipsy, every day that you went dirty, you were disobeying me, whether you knew it or not. If only I'd known, ma'am. You knew well enough that you were disobeying something, though you did not know it was me. But come out and take your chance. Perhaps it may be your last. So Grimes stepped out of the chimney, and really, if it had not been for the scars on his face, he looked as clean and respectable as a master sweep need look. "'Take him away,' said she to the truncheon, "'and give him his ticket of leave.' "'And what is he to do, ma'am?' "'Get him to sweep out the crater of Etna. He will find some very steady men working out their time there, who will teach him his business. But mind, if that crater gets choked again, and there is an earthquake in consequence, bring them all to me, and I shall investigate the case very severely.' So the truncheon marched off, Mr. Grimes, looking as meek as a drowned worm, and for out I know, or do not know, he is sweeping the crater of Etna to this very day. "'And now,' said the fairy to Tom, "'your work here is done. You may as well go back again.' "'I should be glad enough to go,' said Tom. "'But how am I to get up that great hole again, now that the steam has stopped blowing?' I will take you up the back stairs, but I must bandage your eyes first, for I never allow anybody to see those back stairs of mine. I am sure I shall not tell anybody about them, ma'am, if you bid me not. Aha! So you think, my little man. But you would soon forget your promise if you got back into the land world. For, if people only once found out that you had been up my back stairs, you would have all the fine ladies kneeling to you and the rich men emptying their purses before you, and statesmen offering you place and power, and young and old, rich and poor, crying to you, Only tell us the great backstair secret, and we will be your slaves. We will make you lord, king, emperor, bishop, archbishop, pope, if you like. Only teach us the secret of the back stairs. For thousands of years we have been paying and petting and obeying and worshipping quacks who told us they had the key of the back stairs and could smuggle us up them and in spite of all our disappointments we will honour and glorify and adore and beatify and translate and apotheotize you likewise on the chance of your knowing something about the back stairs that we may all go on pilgrimage to it and even if we cannot get up it lie at the foot of it and cry Oh, backstairs, precious backstairs, invaluable backstairs, requisite backstairs, necessary backstairs, good-natured backstairs, cosmopolitan backstairs, comprehensive backstairs, accommodating backstairs, well-bred backstairs, commercial backstairs, economical backstairs, practical backstairs, logical backstairs, deductive backstairs, comfortable backstairs, humane backstairs, reasonable backstairs, long-sought backstairs, coveted backstairs, aristocratic backstairs, respectable backstairs, gentlemanlike backstairs, ladylike backstairs, orthodox backstairs, probable backstairs, credible backstairs, demonstrable backstairs, irrefragible backstairs, potent backstairs, all but omnipotent backstairs, etc. Save us from the consequences of our own actions, and from the cruel fairy Mrs. B. Dunby as you did. Do not you think that you would be a little tempted to tell them what you know, laddie? Tom thought so, certainly. But why do they want so to know about the back stairs? asked he, being a little frightened at the long words, and not understanding them the least, as indeed he was not meant to do, or you either. That I shall not tell you. I never put things into little folks' heads which are but too likely to come there of themselves. So come, now I must bandage your eyes. So she tied the bandage on his eyes with one hand, and with the other she took it off. 
Now, she said, you are safe up the stairs. Tom opened his eyes very wide, and his mouth too, for he had not, as he thought, moved a single step. But when he looked round him, there could be no doubt that he was safe up the back stairs, whatsoever they may be, which no man is going to tell you, for the plain reason that no man knows. The first thing which Tom saw was the black cedars, high and sharp against the rosy dawn, and St. Brandon's Isle reflected double in the still broad silver sea. The wind sang softly in the cedars, and the water sang among the eaves, the sea-birds sang as they streamed out into the ocean, and the land-birds as they built among the boughs, and the air was so full of song that it stirred St. Brandon and his hermits as they slumbered in the shade, and they moved their good old lips, and sang their morning hymn amid their dreams. But among all the songs one came across the water, more sweet and clear than all, for it was the song of a young girl's voice. And what was the song which she sang? Ah, my little man, I am too old to sing that song, and you too young to understand it. But have patience, and keep your eyes single, and your hands clean, and you will learn some day to sing it yourself, without needing any man to teach you. And as Tom neared the island, there sat upon a rock the most graceful creature that ever was seen, looking down, with her chin upon her hand, and paddling with her feet in the water. And when they came to her, she looked up, and behold, it was Ellie. "'Oh, Miss Ellie,' said he, "'how you are grown!' "'Oh, Tom,' said she, "'how you are grown, too!' And no wonder. They were both quite grown up, he into a tall man, and she into a beautiful woman. "'Perhaps I may be grown,' she said. "'I have had time enough, for I have been sitting here waiting for you many a hundred years, till I thought you were never coming.' many a hundred years, thought Tom, but he had seen so much in his travels that he had quite given up being astonished, and indeed he could think of nothing but Ellie. So he stood and looked at Ellie, and Ellie looked at him, and they liked the employment so much that they stood and looked for seven years more, and neither spoke nor stirred. At last they heard the fairy say, "'Attention, children!' Are you never going to look at me again? We have been looking at you all this while, they said, and so they thought they had been. Then look at me once more, said she. They looked, and both of them cried out at once, Oh, who are you after all? You are our dear Mrs. Do as you would be done by. No, you are good Mrs. Be done by as you did. But you are grown quite beautiful now. To you, said the fairy, but look again. You are Mother Carey, said Tom, in a very low, solemn voice, for he had found out something which made him very happy, and yet frightened him more than all he had ever seen. But you are grown quite young again. To you, said the fairy, look again. You are the Irishwoman who met me the day I went to Hearthover. And when they looked, she was neither of them, and yet all of them at once. My name is written in my eyes, if you have eyes to see it there. And as they looked into her great, deep, soft eyes, and they changed again and again into every hue as the light changes in a diamond, now read my name, said she at last. And her eyes flashed, for one moment, clear, white, blazing light. But the children could not read her name, for they were dazzled, and hid their faces in their hands. Not yet, young things, not yet, said she, smiling, and then she turned to Ellie. You may take him home with you now on Sundays, Ellie. He has won his spurs in the great battle, and become fit to go with you and be a man, because he has done the thing he did not like. So Tom went home with Ellie on Sundays, and sometimes on weekdays too, 
and he is now a great man of science, and can plan railroads, and steam engines, and electric telegraphs, and rifled guns, and so forth, and knows everything about everything, except why a hen's egg don't turn into a crocodile, and two or three other little things, which no one will know till the coming of the coxigrews. And all this from what he learnt when he was a water baby underneath the sea. And of course Tom married Ellie. My dear child, what a silly notion! Don't you know that no one ever marries in a fairy tale under the rank of a prince or princess? And Tom's dog? Oh, you may see him any clear night in July, for the old dog star was so worn out by the last three hot summers that there have been no dog days since, so that they had to take him down and put Tom's dog up in his place. Therefore, as new brooms sweep clean, we may hope for some warm weather this year. And that is the end of my story. End of chapter 8, part 2. This recording is in the public domain.